Now right now you can go ahead and open your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 4 and we'll be reading through it in its entirety today. And as you're turning there, I want to talk to you about the, the title of the, the sermon today. It's, it's called Wisdom. Get Wisdom. I think it's pretty important. And now what we'll be looking at, we'll be looking at biblical wisdom, because it's differently from common sense wisdom. Biblical wisdom is God's view, basically, of everything. To make it pretty simple. And above everything else in our entire life, the scriptures always point us to, we need to get wisdom. We need to get wisdom. I, I don't know about you, but I know about myself. I can be extremely foolish. I can be foolish in the things I do. I can be foolish in the things I say. Looking back at my childhood, I can be foolish in some of the things I wore. Can you relate? And sometimes I'm asked foolish questions, and I, I, I don't know how to give the right answer. Now, if you're married, or if you've been married, you're probably going to relate to what I'm about to say. I love my wife dearly. She's not here right now, so I'm going to go ahead and say it. Uh, uh, but whenever we're going to go out somewhere, my wife sometimes says this to me. She says these, these amazing words in a question form. That's very difficult for me to answer sometimes. Does this make me look fat? And no matter how I answer it, it's never right. No, honey, you look beautiful. You're just saying that. <laughs> you're just saying that because you're my husband. I'm not going to, you know, expound on that. I'm just going to let that one, that one lie there. But the point is, is that life happens all the time, and we are prone to wander, as the hymn says, but, but we also are prone to be foolish, and that's just a, a lighthearted example of, of sometimes I don't necessarily know how to, how to deal with, with life properly. I need wisdom. I'm so grateful and thankful I'm a Christian because I have gray hair. And if you have gray hair and you're not a Christian, well, I mean, it's just gray hair. <laughs> At least when you're a Christian, you can claim <laughs> your gray hair is because of wisdom. <laughs> right? And if you're out there with gray hair, you're like, A to the men. <laughs> now, wisdom is knowledge. There's one part knowledge. You can, you can read God's Word and, and draw from it. And you can, you can gain wisdom from, from just reading it. But there's also wisdom that is through experience. Meaning, you read God's Word and then you walk it out. You apply it to your life. And most of us have, have heard this or, or learned this. That typically wisdom kind of happens uh, one or two ways. It's either learned the hard way or it's passed down. And an example of this would be um, some of you in here were, were children once. And you might have messed around with an electrical outlet before. I remember being a child, and I took a fork, and I stuck it in the electrical outlet. Not smart. I learned the hard way that when you stick a fork in an electrical outlet, it electrocutes you. So what did I do from, from that moment? Well, well, I tried to pass that information down <laughs> to anybody and everybody who would listen. I had two brothers, and when they grabbed the forks and they were running to the outlet, you know, I was like, no, 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 don't do it. Don't do it. Trust me. <laughs> I've learned the hard way. And in life, you have all sorts of different lessons learned that way. Now, the Proverbs was a well of wisdom for the nation of Israel. They would, they would draw wisdom from the Proverbs. Now, Proverbs simply means a, an obvious truth through a saying or an expression. Now, King Solomon wrote most of the Proverbs, and he was most definitely uh, the inspiration behind them all. See, Solomon asked God for, for wisdom to, to shepherd and to lead his people. And God gave it to him. And we see this in 1 Kings 4, starting in verse 29. God, God gave Solomon wisdom and very great insight and the breadth of understanding as measureless as the sand on the seashore. Solomon's wisdom was greater than the wisdom of all the people of the east and greater than all the wisdom of Egypt. Take that, Egypt. That's just a little dig right there, right? Reflecting on, on, on the Mecca of the world at that time, Egypt had it going on, and God pulled his people out of bondage of these lost people. And then verse 32, he says this, He spoke 3,000 proverbs 
and his songs numbered a thousand and five. Meaning Solomon was a fountain of wisdom. If you had a problem and you wanted some guidance, Solomon was the man to go to. Now let's go ahead and look at Proverbs chapter 4, starting in verse 1. And let's look at, let's see how the proverb flowed through Solomon's life, and then how it can flow through ours. I mean, how can we apply these words to our lives? How can we learn from him? Verse 1, listen, my sons, to a father's instruction. Pay attention and gain understanding. Now when I read that verse, I think of when I grew up, and my father would sit me down from time to time and he would give me some, some instructions about certain things in life. My dad was really good at teaching me about common sense. Like things to watch out for. Like don't trust strangers. Right? That I need to be aware of things that are happening around me. Because people are bad and people do bad things. And my dad was trying to protect me. He was trying to instruct me. To take care of me. Now, when I was five years old, my dad gave me my first knife. Which is kind of funny. I don't know how much wisdom was in that. <laughs> but but he instructed me in the way of the knife. And it was a Swiss Army knife. And those of you who have had Swiss Army knives you know that they don't lock. And so my dad was trying to, to, to make sure I understood that. And because if I were to stroke the knife in the wrong direction, it would close on me. And so I remember, I, yes, sir, listen, okay, okay, and I grabbed that knife, and oh my gosh, I was Rambo in the woods. <laughs> I just, five years old, boom, darted out to the woods, I broke some sticks up, and I was sitting there shotgun, I was making little spears, right, just a good five-year-old boy, right, I was going to, I was going hunting. And I remember on, on one of the strokes, I must have flipped the knife around, and the knife closed on me, and it, it, it closed on my thumb. I still have a scar to this day, and I remember it, and I remember it cut me deep, and, and I, I knew I was in trouble when I ran home, and I was crying to my father, and, and you know what he told me, the words that nobody ever likes to hear? I told you so. <laughs> I told you so. Verse 2, I give you sound learning, so do not forsake my teaching, for I too was a son to my father, still tender and cherished by my mother. I love this part of the proverb because Solomon is drawing us uh, into his family. See, Solomon, he says this, I too was a son, this is King Solomon, to my father, King David, still tender and cherished by my mother, O Sheba. Then he taught me, and he said to me, take hold of, of my words with all your heart, keep my commands, and you will live. See, King David was teaching the future king of Israel the ways of the Lord. He was passing them down. And right here in this proverb, we, we see three generations of truth being passed right here. We see David, who passed the, the ways of the Lord to, to Solomon. And then we see Solomon, who received it, is now putting it in words and passing it down to his children. See, Solomon is living out Deuteronomy 6, verse 2. This is what, what Moses said to the, to the Israelites as they were getting ready to enter in and to claim the promised land. He said, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you. And so that you may enjoy long life. Christians, we've we got to remember this. If we want to enjoy life, we need to get wisdom. See, when we seek wisdom, we can avoid wisdom many wrong turns. We can, we can go down, down, we can avoid many roads that we didn't have to go down. Some of us have, have went down these, these, these roads. And we learn lessons, but, but if we seek wisdom, we can avoid a whole lot of wasted time of learning things the hard way by listening to those who went down that path and say, okay, I don't want to go down that path. And if you continue to read Deuteronomy 6, this is what is known as the Shema. And that is just simply the Hebrew word for, for listen. And this is what the Israelites would learn as children by their fathers. This was super important. And this is what it said. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commands that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on 
your gaze. See, this is wisdom. See, fathers, you are to impart this wisdom to your children. And not just a one-time event. You are consumed by passing down this information because it's important. It's important that we impress this on our children's hearts. See, failure to do this will, will lead us into, into Judges chapter 2. Those of you who were at church last weekend, before prayer time, I read Judges chapter 2, and then we discovered the, the failure of a generation of the Israelites. After Joshua and Caleb conquered the, prom the promised land, and they settled in, that whole generation passed away, and then another generation grew up, and the Bible tells us that, that they didn't know the ways of the Lord. They, they, didn't, they didn't know the great things that God did for Israel. And then they turned from God and they did wicked in His sight. See, why is it important for us to pass down godly wisdom and godly truth to the next generation? To avoid that. You see, passing down wisdom enables our children to stay right with God. See, some of us, we had the opposite effect where I was passed down what was wrong and then God intervened in my life and then brought me to what was right. Now I have an opportunity to pass down the truth, God's wisdom, to the next generation. Amen? Now we'll see the failure of this. We'll see the failure of this, um, this great wisdom that Solomon had from God to be passed down to his children or to be received by his, his son. See, Solomon himself would fail to this great wisdom through his wives and his concubines, and he would be overcome by idolatry. So see, the very thing that he was promoting, the very thing that he was a fountain of, he himself would eventually not apply it to his life. And there would be a breakdown from King Solomon to King Roboam. To King Roboam was Solomon's son. And in 1 Kings chapter 12, we see the, the breakdown in this passing down of wisdom. See, King Solomon put a heavy burden on Israel. See, Israel became the most beautiful nation in the world. But it took a lot of work to make Israel beautiful, to build the temple, to take care of the streets, to, for the infrastructure. It was, it was hard labor for the Israelites. See, King Solomon put a heavy yoke upon the people to make Israel beautiful. And then after Solomon passed away, Rehoboam inherited this mess. It looked pretty on the outside, but it was a mess with the people spiritually and emotionally. And this other guy, Jeroboam, easy to remember, Roboam, Jeroboam. Jeroboam was head of the, the labor force. And he came to Roboam and said, listen, you need to lighten the, the yoke upon your people. And so Roboam listened to him. And then what did Rome do? Roboam do? Well, he went and sought counsel from the elders. See, he, he sought wisdom. And the elders told him, listen, if you listen to what the people want... They will love you and follow you all the days of your life. Well, he didn't like that. So what did he do? Well, he went, to, he went to another group of people. He went to the younger generation. The guys who grew up with him. Full of pride and, 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 and authority. And wanted to make a name for themselves. And what did they tell him? He said, they're, they said listen, if they think King Solomon was hard, no, he'd be a thousand times harder. Your yoke will, will surpass your father's. Well, what did he do? Well, he ended up taking, he ended up taking the, the guidance of the, the younger generation. He didn't listen to the older generation. See, he failed to grab a hold of wisdom and apply it to his life. Well, what ended up happening? Well, Israel, as we know, it split into two nations because of that. See, the kingdom was divided because of the failure to receive wisdom and to apply it to his life. Now, this will happen in our own family. See, a, fa a failure from the father to pass down godly wisdom to his children will cause a split in the family tree. See, for, for years, your family's moved in this direction, rooted and established in the Lord, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, if the father fails to pass down the wisdom of the Lord to his children, or the children refuse to receive it, there will be a split and the tree, the kingdom, so to speak, will go two different ways. Now, this is why we thank God for the gospel. This is why we thank God for the gospel. That, that God sent His Son to live, to die, and to be resurrected for us. See, Christ was the perfect Son who always 
listen to the wisdom of his father. See, there is never, ever a breakdown in communication of passing down the wisdom from Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That's the hope that we have in the gospel. Because right now, some of you guys are like, well, what if, what if I fail? Here's the, here's the good news. And bad news. You will. You will. You're going to fail some way or another. You will fail as a father or as a mother in passing down the wisdom of the Lord. You will fail. And here's the other side. Your kids will fight it. They will fight receiving it. But here's the, here's the good news in it all. It has nothing to do with your work, whether or not your children receive the gospel. It is of the Lord. See, I'd rather trust you. it's God's responsibility to make all this work than to say it's all on me. Some of it is on me, but it isn't all on me. That's the beauty and hope of the gospel. Now remember, when we're talking about the wisdom in the word, this is godly wisdom, not, not worldly wisdom. Godly wisdom makes us more Christ-like. So godly wisdom is us coming to an understanding of God, meaning who God is and ourselves, who we are in the world, our relationship with it. See, only God can reveal His truth and His wisdom. As Paul, as Paul says to the church at Corinth, he says that, that to those who are perishing, the gospel is complete foolishness. But to those who are being saved by it, it is the power of God. Back to Proverbs Chapter 4, verse 5. Get wisdom. Get understanding. Do not forget my words or turn away from them. Now there's four points in this verse right here I want to touch on. Number one, remember Roboam. See, do not forget my words and turn away from them. We can, we can learn. We can, we can, we can glean some, some wisdom from Roboam's failure to receive wisdom from his father and from the, 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 the council of the elders of Israel. Remember, Robo, don't, don't turn from wisdom. Number two, how do we get wisdom? How do I get understanding? The Bible. We, we read God's Word. Like you're out there and you're like, I don't know how to be a husband. Read the Bible. I don't know how to be a father. Read the Word. I don't know how I'm supposed to handle money. Read the Bible. I don't know how I'm supposed to approach God. Read the Bible. I don't know how I'm supposed to live my life. Read the Bible. How do, how do I address hot topics in this world? Read the Bible. See, that's, that's our fountain of wisdom as Christians. We have God's Word available to us. And if there's any struggle that you come across in life and you're like, I don't know how to handle it, read the Bible. Brother James says in chapter 1, he says, anybody who lacks wisdom, ask God, and He freely gives it to you. Well, where do we have this, this, this free wisdom at? In the Bible. What else do we do to, to gain wisdom? Pray. Like, Lord, I don't know how to handle this situation. Like, I feel like I should address it. Like, my brother's slipping, but I know it's not that big of a deal in, 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 in some aspects, but in others, I think it's a really big deal. I don't know, should I talk to him, should I not? Like, what do I do? Pray. Pray, how else do we get wisdom? Fellowship, communion with God. How else do we get wisdom? The, the elders of the church. If you have a struggle with something, seek an elder of the church. Number three. The Hebrew word for wisdom is hakma. That's fun to say, right? And it means wisdom the way we know it, knowledge and experience. And then also, this is the really cool one. Skill and war. Think about that. Wow. Wisdom, skill, and war. And that leads us into number four. That we need to receive from those who have ran the, the, the race of faith before us. We need to receive the truth that they have. Because they have skill in spiritual warfare that we might not understand and might not know. We need to, we need to be, be sponges to those who are, are before us. Who have ran the race of faith and have fought the good fight. We need to receive from their Battles. We need to, to grab a hold of their skill. Verse 6. Do not forsake wisdom. She will protect you. Love her and she will watch over you. I think about what Paul tells Timothy. He says, preserve your doctrine. He, meaning, preserve your understanding of Scripture. And it will save your life and also those who hear you sharing of the Word. See, truth protects wise men and women. How? Well, if we, we, 
we walk in God's wisdom, well, we'll make less errors in life. We'll avoid some things that were avoidable by receiving God's wisdom. Truth protects. Verse 7, the beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom. I love that part. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom. Meaning that wisdom starts with God and then ends with God. Though it costs all you have, get understanding. See, we need to have this desire as Christians that we need to seek godly wisdom above everything else. Because it is eternal. It's priceless. Godly wisdom applied to our lives helps us walk in more obedience than not. It helps us worship God in areas of our life that we fail to worship God in. Jesus says that the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. And when a man found it, he hid it. And in his joy, he sold everything that he had so he could buy that field. See, see, that's godly, that's godly wisdom. And Paul, Paul says this, that he considered everything garbage a loss compared to Christ. And Job said, though they slay me, though they slay me, I will trust in him. See, we need it. We need to get it. We need to get wisdom. Cherish her and she will exalt you. Embrace her and she will honor you. She will give you a garland to grace your head and present you with a glorious crown. What does that mean? Godly wisdom. Well, when we seek godly wisdom, you know what happens to you? People end up respecting you. They, they honor you. They trust you. People who seek godly wisdom... Are the people other people seek for advice. When they have a problem in life, they will come to you. They're like, I need help. And I've noticed that, that you tend to fall less. And, and I want that. I want to fall less. I want to make less errors in my life. Like, like, how do you do it? See, that's the garland that God graces us with when we walk in wisdom. It means that we have gray hair, either physically or metaphorically, because of the experience of the battles that we've been in, Hakma, the skill in war that we've learned through fighting the good fight in the name of Christ. It means that, is that we've held true to God's word even when it was unpopular. Even when you face persecution, you said, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to move from this pillar. It means this. All along your Christian life, you never, ever, ever forget that you were saved by God's grace. That you're saved by faith in Christ. Because it's easy to forget that as you get more healthier. It's easy to think, well, I've done some good things. Check out these works. Well, remember, none of that matters. You can only do those good works because of this great grace that God did by applying Christ's works to your life. Never forget that. See, when you forget it, you become arrogant. You become prideful. You become self-righteous. See, that's not wise. That's the opposite. We've we fight the good fight, as I said. What do we do? We, we finish the race. That's what people who apply godly wisdom to their life. Now, here's the good news. We will fall short. We will make mistakes. We will struggle. But we learn. We repent. We struggle less. God forgives. See, we can only fight the good fight. We can only finish this race of faith because of God's forgiveness and grace. And may we never forget that. We don't have to carry these things alone in life. Verse 10. Listen, my son. Accept what I say. And the years of your life will be many. I instruct you in the way of wisdom and lead you along straight paths. See, ministers of the gospel, we must remember this passage right here. See, it's our responsibility to point people to the path. To the right path. We, we, we talk about the way. We tell people to repent. And to believe in Christ as the only means to be right with God. If you're coming out of drug addiction, you know what we say? Like, listen, if you don't get your life right, you are going to die. Like, trust me, I have learned the hard way. Through overdoses, jail, divorces, losing children. Like, don't keep going that way. We point them the right way. Verse 12. When you walk, your steps will not be hampered. When you run, you will not stumble. See, we... As Christians, we walk in the light as Christ is in the light. See, the blind lead the blind, the lost. They bump into things. They don't move through life well. Verse 13, hold on to instruction. 
Do not let it go. Guard it well, for it is your life. Do not set foot on the path of the wicked or walk in the way of evildoers. I mean, Solomon said, don't even think about it, guys. Even though he wouldn't listen to his own advice, we should listen to his advice. Don't, don't even think about it. Don't walk in the way of evildoers. Meaning this, I, this is how we can apply this, this to our lives. I mean, this, if, that you are, are, if you've been transformed and forgiven by the grace in Christ, and, and you're walking in the purpose. You're trying to, 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 to be a blessing and not a curse. And you're trying to share the good news. You know one place you'll never, ever, ever share the good news at? If you used to smoke crack, you never share the good news in a crack house. Because that place is bad news for you. If you're an alcoholic, ex, don't ever go into a bar and try to minister the grace in Christ. You should avoid it. That's wisdom. Not that you will fall, but you could. You could. Do not set foot on that path. Don't, don't even think about it. Avoid it. Do not travel on it, Solomon says. Turn from it and, you, and, and go on your way. Meaning that sometimes in life, gentlemen, we have to take the long way because the short way might be susceptible to us failing. So sometimes you've got to go the long way. You've got to deal with the accountability. You've got to deal with the struggle. You gotta deal with the hardship. You gotta deal with some some humility, maybe some humiliation. You have to go the long way sometimes, because if you go the short way, you might set foot on the wrong path. See, because we gotta remember that these this or these type of people still exist. For they cannot rest until they do evil. They are robbed of sleep till they make someone stumble. I used to be this person. I was nasty. My, my purpose in life was try to take people off of the right paths. I didn't know it. I was in denial of this, but, but this was really the heartbeat of my life. Verse 17, they eat the bread of wickedness. This is the heart of Adam. And drink the wine of violence. See, the flesh is hostile to God. But what is Solomon saying here? This is, this is super simple. This is great wisdom. Meaning that if you avoid sinfulness, and if you avoid people who, are, who have or in the, the lifestyle of wrong living, guess what's going to happen to you? You will fall to sin less. Duh. It's like, I put it like this. If you, if you have a problem with eating candy, right, and you make it a purpose in your life to not step foot in candy stores, you'll probably eat less, less candy. Verse 18, the path of righteousness is like the morning sun, shining ever brighter till the full light of day. There's a beauty in having peace with God. But the way of the, the wicked is, is like deep darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. This is denial. I remember when I wasn't a Christian, and I remember when I was walking in my addiction, I didn't understand this deep darkness. I didn't understand what made me stumble. I was always like, I just no matter what I do, nothing ever works out. I didn't understand where the problem really lied. It was with myself towards God and towards everything that God stands for. Verse 20, my son, pay attention to what I say. Turn your ears to my words. And I think about when we look into Solomon's life that David instructed Solomon in, in the ways of the Lord and Solomon was passing down this truth to Rehoboam, but Rehoboam wouldn't pay attention. He wouldn't listen to his father. Well, how can we apply this, this, this portion of Scripture to our, our own lives? Meaning this, when God speaks, listen. Listen, pay attention to what he, he says. It is tremendously fruitful. Verse 21, do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart. Meaning that we should treasure up God's words in us. Like there is a, there's, a, there's a couple of words that I really hold on to inside of my heart. That God forgives me and that he loves me and that I'm sorry. I, got those, I treasure those, those words. For they are life to those who find them and held to one's whole body. And Jesus says that man doesn't live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from God's mouth. And I, I think of the Beatitudes here where Jesus says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Righteousness, the, the essence and the substance of being right with God, it blesses your whole body when you desire godly things. Above all else, guard your heart. For everything you do flows from it. And I think of regeneration, the, the act of God making us alive, giving us a new heart, a new nature. See, we need to guard this new heart that we receive 
at salvation because it took the death of God to give it to us. So we better guard it. We better cherish it because this new heart pumps new blood through my body. It gives me a different posture towards the things of God. Meaning that I, I start to desire obedience more than I desire disobedience. And everything I do flows from it. Remember, the, the Greek word for heart is cardia. And, and it means passion, affection, desires. And I usually say it's your pad, it's your home, it's where you live. Everything you do in life flows from your heart. Keep your mouth free from perversity. Keep, keep corrupt talk far from your lips. See, small trips lead to big falls. And, and I, this, this scripture right here, I'm reading through it, I was like, dang it, I do this. Like, I do this. Sometimes I can say some pretty some pretty perverse things. Like, I can have some pretty uh, corrupt talk. And my justification is, is that oh, I'm just being human. Or I'm being relatable. You know, because i gotta, I got to actually uh, purpose myself to, to say sinful things to relate to sin, sinners. Because I'm so holy, right? <laughs> Come on. Really? Like, oh, yeah, let me say some, just some, some perverse things so I can just get along with the heathens a little better. Now that's a justification for what's still in me that's wrong. It is wrong. So I have to confess it so the Lord can make it right. Verse 25. Let your, your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before Him. And as Christ says, seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. Give careful thought to the paths for your feet. Be steadfast in all your ways. Remember that there is a path that seems right to a person. But in the end, it's destruction. We need to remember to get wisdom. Do not turn to the right or to the left. Keep your foot from evil. What do we need to do? We need to get wisdom. I need wisdom. I'm a fool apart from God's grace. Now the greatest wisdom, true, that we ever can receive is the gospel. That is the greatest wisdom that we can ever receive. All wisdom starts there. That I'm saved by God's grace in faith, in Christ's life, death, and resurrection. Get wisdom. We need wisdom. I need wisdom. I need wisdom on how to engage with God. I need wisdom on how to engage with my wife. I need wisdom on how to engage with my kids. I need wisdom on how to engage with the entire world. I need wisdom just to do life. Now we end today in Matthew 7, 24 through 25. Now this is the greatest sermon ever preached. It's the end of the Sermon on the Mount. And I think that our Lord really highlights the importance of getting wisdom and how it, it stabilizes your entire life. He says this, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it has its foundation on the rock. Get godly wisdom no matter the cost. We need wisdom. We need the wisdom of Christ. We need the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. We need the wisdom of God. And this is our prayer. Lord, teach us to walk in all your ways. Give us wisdom on all areas of our life. Give us wisdom of the greatest truth that we've ever seen, which is Christ. Which is Christ. And so that's that's the the thing that we should we should pray for. I was going to say challenge, but the problem with challenges is sometimes challenges don't change. See, we all need change. I need change. Like I need change, and the only one who can change me is the grace of God. And so that's what we pray for in seeking wisdom. We seek wisdom in God's word. We seek wisdom through prayer. We seek wisdom through our relationship with God through communion. We seek wisdom through the elders of the church. Amen.